Well, anyway, we're back now, and uh, I appreciated Mr. Uh, Ames' comments about the work and the news of the work and growth in Canada in that letter. One thing that came out since the bulletin was written the other day, Mr. Uh, Bryce told me just before he left yesterday, just before noon, that they had pretty well finished counting the feast of tenants, and the feast of tenants for this year, counting the whole world, was just barely under 7,000. And with the stay-at-homes that actually requested tapes from us, we did have over 7,000 people with us at the feast. When you count those tapes, there were over 200 people getting the tapes at home, counting elderly people and so on. It was, I think, the, I'm pretty sure he said it was 6,917 that we know attended. I may, we may find a few others later, plus the tapes, about 200 tapes. So at any rate, we're running right at 7,000 people, and uh, that's good. But that's just a very, very tiny beginning, as we all know. And the big growth we're going to have is in the impact of the work, not just in numbers of people. And I think we all know that. Brethren, God has to do a far, far greater work through somebody, and that somebody can be us if we do our part. All the churches of God together, you know, that have carried on anything like whatsoever, Mr. Armstrong's work, are less than 50,000 in attendance, all of them put together. And uh, that's very, very few people when you consider the whole earth has a population of 6.3 billion people. So we're all very tiny, as I said, half of a peanut shell of the Pacific Ocean. And that's about where we are at this time. So we have to know and I believe in a real God. But I'm quite sure that over the next two to five years, as I've said recently in prophetic sermons, people are going to come to understand that better if they have been hearing this program, if they're in the living church of God, and if their ears are open, and if they're willing to listen and to think. And that's part of my sermon today. I understand last time you had a very fine sermon from Mr. Charles Bryce on prayer. And I didn't think about this sermon because of that. I really didn't. I thought about this topic because of things that are going on. But then later I thought about it. I mean, I thought about it first and later I heard he given a sermon on prayer. So the two tie in together very, very well, as you will see. Many of us today, brethren, lack the spiritual depth. We just lack spiritual depth not just you in this room, but you brethren around the world, all of us, and the stability that we ought to have. And of course, this world, frankly, this whole human society is designed by Satan the devil to keep our thinking shallow. Satan does that. The American people generally have an eight or nine minute attention span. And that's been written of, you know, about eight or nine minutes television switches to a commercial. And so often they're getting that. They like Reader's Digest type articles, a digest of this, a digest of that. They don't want the whole thing. They want it quick. And in deciding who will be the next president of the United States, most people have no real idea whatsoever who they ought to vote for. They don't know John Kerry. They don't know President Bush. All they know is little bits and pieces. They have a better idea of President Bush, of course, because of the fruits. But John Kerry, they really don't know. And so each side presents these, quote, sound bites they call it, sound bites, just a quick Kerry said this, or Bush did that, and get him, get him, get him, to try to destroy the character and the honor, the name of the other individual, rather than laying out a complete positive program of what they're going to do. Of course, God tells us we should not be in human politics, we're not to be in the politics or the wars of this world. I would say to you, brethren, here, it's too late for you, brethren, getting this later, but I do hope all of us will do our part as far as the next election. And our part is to spend time on our knees for the next few days, for about the next 10 days, asking the great God who sets up kings and takes down kings to guide this the right way. He can do that. Either one is not going to be able to start to commence to straighten out the problems of the United States or this world. They're just not at all. But God can guide it so it's the right one as far as His purpose and His work and our Christian lives. Because we are to pray for our leaders that God would guide them to guide and keep peace so that we may worship God in honesty and godliness and without fear. And we can ask God to bring the next president in who will fit His purpose to bring about the kingdom and also to help His people have the freedom for the next several years to do His work better 
according to his will, and he can intervene. There are all kinds of little ways God can intervene to the weather in a certain part of the country or some unusual ad or circumstance to, sh to show, show, throw the election one way or the other. You know that. God can easily do that, especially when the election is supposed to be this close. So God is in charge, and we have to do that. But this world is designed to keep our thinking shallow. We have television. That's where these maybe young cigarette-smoking characters out in Hollywood, you know, peck out some script and try to grab people's attention. And the average television show, they admit themselves. They tell you that it's designed for a 12 to 14-year-old mind. It's not designed for an adult mentality at all. It's just shoot them ups and go here and go there, illicit sex, something to divert you from reality. And, of course, the, most of the stuff on the Internet, most of the things you read about in the news magazines, and especially newspapers and, and, and regular magazines, and you see in the motion pictures are that way. And it's just very, very shallow. Satan wants to keep us diverted. You start to do something, there's a telephone call. You start to do something, there's a helicopter overhead. There's a new TV program coming. Something else happens. You don't just sit and have time to think and to think, why am I here? What is going on? Is there a real God? And if there is such a real God, what does he really, really want me to do in this and that and this other situation? Satan tries to keep our thinking shallow. And he's designed the whole world that way. And we've got to get over that, of course. We're going to be facing some terrible situations, as I've already pointed out, over the next several years. And I don't mean now 20 or 30 years. I really deeply feel it will be more like the next 7 to 17 years and probably less than that. We're really down to the wire. We're really down to the wire on this thing and it's going to begin to speed up. That is prophetic events. And back in Matthew 24 where Jesus was asked, Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Not 70 A.D., but the end of this age. And he began to give them the signs. Take, no, take heed that no one deceives you. And as the first seal points out, a man on white horse, false prophets were going to come. The next thing to happen was wars. And of course, that was the, horse of, the red horse of war. And the next thing, of course, was to be famines, disease epidemics, the pale horse of Revelation 6. And next, uh, uh, of course, pestilence or death. And you're going to have that happen. Those things are going to happen over the next several years, more than they have ever happened in human history. And I really mean that, more than they have ever happened in human history. All these are the beginning of sorrows, not the end. Verse 9, then they will deliver you, and he's talking here to his disciples, and that does include us today. We know other scriptures tell us that the majority of people who are watching and praying really watching and really praying and walking with God will be taken to a place of safety. They will be, and God promises that. But as a whole, God's people are not really watching and praying. A lot of people I know and love and see out there, so I met some of them this recent trip, nice people, nice people. They want to be in their comfort zone, and they don't get excited about the Word of God. They don't get excited about the work of God. They're not trying to go out and give their lives, if need be, to reach this nation before it's too late. That's not part of their thinking at all. That's not part of their actions. But God says about His people as a whole, since we're in the Laodicean era, they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And as I pointed out, brethren, they cannot hate us unless they know us. And we and some of the other Church of God groups are going to have to do a work so powerful that the world will begin to know who we are and they will resent it bitterly because we will, as this lady wrote in from Canada, we will be willing to call a spade a spade and get right out there even at the danger of our very lives. And he that seeks to save his life will lose it and he that loses his life for my sake, Jesus said, will find it. And we've got to have that attitude. We really do. We need to have that attitude. That had better be our approach. If we have to give up this life, then we need to give up this life. And right, think the whole thing through. 
and be willing to understand and to follow through on what we know is the absolute truth. So we've got to become more deep. Turn to Psalm chapter 1, if you would. As we see these things approaching, my brethren, and as we see this terrible time when we're going to be hated by all men, For the sake of Jesus Christ and terrible persecution is going to come and terrible drought, disease epidemics, massive earthquakes such as has never been in modern times and all those other things. We have to think through what we're going to do. We have to think through who we are and who we are going to be and how we're going to continue to hang on to the truth and think it through very, very deeply to where we cannot be shaken. In Psalm chapter 1, God writes through the man who was a man after God's own heart, King David of Israel, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. The more you watch worldly television, see the movies, hook into this world in various ways, the more you're going to be influenced by that stuff, by those attitudes, those attitudes, those attitudes that are being broadcast by Satan the devil. Don't hook into that the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Some people say, yeah, well, you know, we've heard about this before, blah, 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 they get scornful. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful, God warns you. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Now, brethren, I think all of us are mature enough, hopefully most of us here, to understand that in the Old Testament God talked about the law, but the New Testament had yet been, not yet been written. So when I sometimes read some of these scriptures, I hope we can enlarge it, enlarge our thinking to realize that it doesn't just mean the Ten Commandments. Obviously, we must do that too, and the statutes. But the whole Word of God were to feed on Christ. Feed on Christ. John chapter 6, verse 57. Drink into this whole book. And have the mind of Christ in every possible way. And have the word of God, the thoughts of God, the mind of God in our mind, in our heart. And constantly be thinking of that. And so blessed is the man whose delight is in the word of God, the law of God. And in his law, in his word, he meditates. Meditates day and night. I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about a tremendous power. It is a tremendous power when you understand it, can help you, deepen you, strengthen you in a way that perhaps nothing else can. You've got to do the other things first, though. You've got to do what Mr. Bryce talked about last Sabbath. You've got to pray to God, the true God of the Bible, heartfeltly on your knees. You've got to drink in and study this book so you know what to think about. But after you've done that, you'd better do the other thing, and that is to meditate, to meditate on God's Word and to think through all the facets of your life, the things that are happening around you, the things that are about to happen, and try to think through in advance, what are you going to do about it? What are you personally going to do about it as these things start happening? And are you now laying the foundation where you will, in fact, do the right thing, or are you making compromises along the way where when the real trial comes, you probably will make compromises then too? If you let up and you drink too much or you lapse back into smoking or you lapse back into drugs or you slap back, lapse back into cursing or you lapse back into completely losing your temper, you lapse back into whatever it is on a regular basis or very often at all, then when real trials come, what are you going to do? You have to think those things through very carefully. Turn to Psalm chapter 8, again talking about David and understanding this man who God loves so much and why God loved him. Psalm 8, O eternal our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You who set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and infants you've ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, now here, brethren, was a man who was a man after God's own heart who loved God, worshipped God, adored God, thought of God again and again, And in the quiet, long, long evening hours as a young teenager and perhaps into his early 20s with no television, no radio, no telephone, no 
computer, no nothing, out under the stars at night in the clear Middle Eastern sky, no smog, he looked up often, over and over, night after night, often he was out there alone, apparently, from what you read. And many young men were sent out like this. Their older father trusted them. They'd be out a night or two or longer. I talked to a young person back in Colorado years ago who was sent out a night by himself and stayed out sometimes for several nights in a row by his father in this big ranch. He didn't resent that. He thought that was exciting. Not when he was a kid, but he was 15, 17 years old. He had his 30, 30, and so on. But to watch his father's animals at night, five or ten miles away from home, or more perhaps. But David did do that. And he looked up the stars there, and he thought, the Creator's up there, the Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, and I'm down here. And that God is real, and I've got to serve that great God no matter what. And he thought it through, and he decided to do it, obviously. And when the trials came, he did do it. He did do it in a remarkable way. You and I may not think that deeply. We're just kind of, well, I don't know, and this person bothers me over here, and we see this over there, and this comes at us in television, and this comes at us in music, and the telephone rings, and we're like this. And we don't take the time to get down on our knees and beg God to clean us up and scrub us out and to make us like He is. And we don't take the time to look up at the stars and just think, that great being is up there made those stars hundreds and thousands and millions of light years away. So far away it's hard to imagine. And those, some of those stars were shining way back before Adam was born and way back millions of years before that as far as that's concerned. And the light is just now coming to us, apparently. Things like that. And to think that God is so great, He's so powerful. What could have made, you know, the watch thing. People used to say that proves the existence of God, and it does. You find a watch on the beach somewhere. This is not a terribly expensive watch, by the way. It's my 25-year anniversary watch in the work. I guess I heard they got them wholesale for about $70, but I'm glad it has my name written in the back in 25 years in the work of God. Seiko, but it keeps better time than a better watch I have, so I wear it more often. But you find this watch, even this watch, on the sand by the sea, you say, oh, well, ocean waves and sun and wind and sea somehow kept on going for several thousand years, and they put this together and gradually got it all going and wound it up, and here it is. Oh, is that so? <laughs> well, what's much more powerful and much, much more complicated than a watch? The human eye, the human ear, and what's much more powerful than that? The human mind, the mind of man, way above even the animal brain which is, has instinct. The human mind, who made your mind, a great God who made your mind and gives you the power to think, to create things in a certain sense, put them together in a way they've never been put together before and even to back off and laugh at yourself and all this kind of thing. The human mind, the mind of man that is in a limited sense like the mind of God were made in God's image in that way. We alone of all creation have that kind of capacity, the creative capacity that God has to a much smaller degree, of course. There is that great God that gave you the very mind with which you're thinking now. He made you in His image for a purpose. And you have to really back off and think, and did that God leave us without really something we can know His will by? Well, you can study the things about the Bible and prove the Bible's inspired. It might be good if you do that. But God did not leave us. He gave us this book, the inspired revelation. We can learn about God, we find through the Bible, by the creation and see that the creation demands a creator. We can see that the words of this book are real because they describe instance after instance and time after time when that God who inspired this book did intervene and bring Egypt down, not out. He said He would bring them down and they would be a third or fourth rate nation. And that's what they've been ever since. He brought other city states down, but not out. But he brought some down and out. And he said he would. And he did. He describes the four great ruling empires, the Babylonian, and of course later the Persian, Greco-Macedonian, and then the Roman. And shows finally the world, this society would end with the final revival of the Roman Empire, which would rise, as we see now today, it is rising in Europe, eventually with just ten key nations 
Say, oh, they're 25. Ha, ha, it can't happen. Oh, is that so? But of course, as Dr. Winnell has explained and others who read it, they're already talking about an inner core, six or seven. It'll end up being ten. And as I said, Britain will not be there because the great God indicates that. That's why Britain will definitely not be there. Am I hanging myself out on the end of a tree? Yes. If God is real, I'll be fine. But Britain will not be in that final ten nations, period. But there will be ten. There will be an inner core if the others are still together at all, which remains to be seen. God tells us instance after instance specific things, and that God is real, and that God is beginning to intervene now. And we're now there near the end of 6,000 years of human experience, as we've been telling you the last few months in a way we never were sure of before, but it is coming together. And God is impressing that on our minds where we understand, yes, we really are right down toward the end and we need to get with it. We cannot play church. We cannot have our little office and sort of little group and we live our little lives here. No, there's this big world of events churning out there. And we've got to cry out, each one of us, help us to get right with you. And help us to love each other, forgive each other, repent of our sins. Repent of the wrong things that people have done to each other, even in the church. Get over it. Move on. And give our lives to God. And he that seeks to save his life will lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake will find it, Jesus said. We've got to think over this in relationship to that great God whom David said he looked up and saw the heavens, the moon, and the stars which you've ordained and he said, what is man that you're mindful of him, us little human beings down here, the son of man that you visit him? For you've made him a little lower than the angels. The Greek word here is Elohim or the Hebrew word. Yes, a little lower for a little while lower than the Elohim. And even Elohim, of course, can be translated and is one of the words for God. So God, that may be, in fact, what God meant, a little lower than God. And we are made that way for a little while because we're going to be born of God in a few years if we're willing to learn and to change and to grow. And you have crowned him with glory and honor and given him dominion over everything and eventually the whole universe, as Hebrews 2 indicates, as we've explained. And so we too need to get out under the stars at night and in other circumstances like David did, and really think things through very, very carefully to know who we are, and to think through and prove to ourselves what we are, what we are going to be, and what we are going to set ourselves to do no matter what. I don't care how difficult it is to keep the Sabbath. I don't care if you're going to be tr having trials and tests or persecutions. I don't care if I get killed or any of us in that sense. We don't want to ask for it, but we have got to do our part to walk with that God, and God is going to hold us responsible for that. He's got to know that we love Him above everything else, including our own lives. He's got to know that before He gives us the kind of power He's going to give us. In Psalm 19, we find again some wonderful words from this man after God's own heart. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. You begin to see a little bit of His power out there when you understand how vast the galaxies are out there. Apparently as many galaxies, not just planets, but galaxies, whole clusters of thousands or millions of stars, and there may be as many galaxies as there are human beings. That's hard to comprehend. The firmament shows His handiwork. Day into day utters speech. Night into night reveals knowledge. You see, as you look up and understand, there is no speech nor language where their voice, or you might say their message, tying it in with uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, where he's talking about the message has gone out all over, where their message, their voice, their rule has not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words, yes, the message coming out of a great God, the words, the teaching, the message by this creation has gone to the end of the world. He says a little bit later uh, in this uh, chapter, I don't want to read it all, but verse 12, who can understand his errors? How can we know where we're wrong? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. I don't always understand everything that I do that is wrong. Sometimes God shows me weeks or months or years later when I look back and realize and repent, hopefully, even then. 
But we need to ask God to clean us up in every way, even of secret sins, things we've done or are doing that we don't fully get, we don't fully grasp at the time. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Well, I'm just going to do this because this is the way I feel and my emotions have got the best of me or whatever. Some people spout off and say things that they should not say, as Mr. Buncher was admonishing us about. Others even knowingly say things that are pretty awful sometimes. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth... And the meditation, here we are again, meditation, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Yes, the meditation, even the things we think, let that be acceptable in God's sight that we learn to bring every thought into captivity to Christ. That's a theme that I preached on here and up in Canada and even during the feast came back to it, as some of you were there, and as parts of sermons, to bring every thought into captivity to Christ. And the only way you're going to do that is by proper meditation to where you think through what everything is about. Then you can gradually bring every thought into captivity to Christ. It's a process, of course. You have to grow in this. Now, meditation is not just like the Orientals practice it or modern hypnosis or things like that. Most of you know that, but in case we have some new members, Christian meditation is not letting your mind go blank. It is not transcendental meditation. It's not oriental meditation, sitting in front of a statue of Buddha and, and sort of sitting there and meditating on his greatness or your mind going blank. It's not that. Christian meditation, brethren, is private devotion to deep, continuous, purposeful reflection Notice, purposeful reflection of the mind on a single theme and in a spirit of prayer. I'll read that again if some of you want to just to kind of summarize it in your notes. Christian meditation is private devotion to deep, continuous, purposeful reflection of the mind on a single theme. Where you don't just let your mind wander. You're going to think about this particular aspect of things for a while, then maybe later another one, or the next day something else. You go down the line, think and analyze and let your mind just take time to do that. Meditation. And in a spirit of prayer, we've got to do it. And yet as we do it, we don't need to be negative. We don't need to be sad. We can be very positive and should be very positive if we have been forgiven of our sins through Jesus Christ and believe in the great God. Turn back to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Here was Paul in prison. He was in a prison in Rome, some kind of a jail there, certainly in his own hired house at least, with a Roman soldier with a spear guarding him and a ball and chain between his ankles. He could have been saying ghastly. My ankles are rubbing raw with this thing. I can't go anywhere. I can't go, you know, what's going on? He said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And boy, is he at hand today more than ever. Be anxious, you see. Don't be upset and worried all the time. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Supplication means continual heartfeltly coming to God over and over, with thanksgiving, though, as you come, say, Father, thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you for my life. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my home. Thank you for food. Thank you for letting me live in this blessed land that's still wealthy and all these things I have for the sun, the moon, the stars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be thankful all day long. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, don't think and just constantly talk about the bad things and try to get people on them or catch people with little things that are not true or not po po proper, not noble. Whatever things are just, if they're good things, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate. There it is again, meditate on these things. Meditate on God and the things of God, obviously. The things which you have learned 
and received and heard and saw in me as they could learn to meditate on what Paul did. Was Paul perfect? No. And of course he goes into great detail about his imperfections in a number of places in his own writings and how God had to be merciful to him. He says, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? And so on as he brought out in Romans chapter 7. And yet overall, Paul loved God, studied the word of God, prayed, cried out to God, obeyed God's commandments, worked and worked, and he said, I have labored more abundantly than they all, drove himself on. And if they would see Paul from the outside, they wouldn't see most of them. They'd see some things that they were close to him because he was human. But most of them would see a man who is constantly praying, studying, driving himself on, raising up churches, healing people, blessing people, giving himself to God all day long. They'd see that. And he said, meditate on that, you see. Meditate on these things and the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me. In my example, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. So we can meditate on the examples of faithful servants of God that we have known. As I've said before, when I have a major decision to make, or sometimes even a middle-level decision, or sometimes even something minor along a certain line, depends on the line you're talking about, I will quite often think of Mr. Herbert Armstrong because he was like a second father. And yet I know his faults, I think I could say honestly, better than anyone in this room because I knew him in a different way for a longer period of time and could tell you that he was a very human being, which he himself said. I've heard Mr. Armstrong say a number of times, he said, Herbert Armstrong has made hundreds of mistakes, brethren, <laughs> but he never let many make some terrible mistake to wreck the work. And that's true. But when I think about certain types of things of quality or should you think big or do this or that or certain many other things, even his example of trying to meditate or to pray several times a day, sometimes prayed, as he said, 30 to 60 times a day when he was in trouble, constant little prayers through the day. I think of things like that, and that helps me as a human being to realize why God used him. I don't have all those personal examples from David or Abraham, you see, or Moses, but I do have them from Mr. Armstrong because I was able to talk to him in his little office up over the library scores maybe hundreds of times and other many other settings in various places around the country and the world and got to hear him tell about those things and somehow when we were real young and just starting out he took some of us under his wing as sons and told us things that perhaps he shouldn't he just tell us tell us if his wife kissed him that morning more or less all kinds of things that kind of amusing to think back on he was a very open man but he was not bragging about his spiritual life. I could see that. He'd tell me problems, but then he'd once in a while come out with something that was very profound, how he'd had to learn lessons by this or that, or how I had to cry out to God with all of his being to get the answer. And those things have been able to be in my mind and to help me to meditate on that and so on. And all of you can learn from those that you have come to know to meditate on if you see that God has, in fact, used them in a right way and as they were still serving God, well, you can meditate on those examples. Very important to think deeply on the things of God and on the right examples you have seen. Turn back to Deuteronomy, if you would, brethren. Deuteronomy, if you would, chapter 6. I'm going to catch a little bit of this tea here. I see that Mr. Ames did not raid my tea here. He just got the, got the water up here. <laughs> the tea's still here. It's warm. For those of you out in TV land later, why well, Mr. Ames made the announcements and he, he, he drank some of the water, but he left the tea for me. <laughs> anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Eternal is one. You shall love the Eternal your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Boy, that's hard in one way. Think about that. That's a huge command. And yet we've got to think about that, meditate on that. What do we put in place of God? I put certain things in place of God perhaps throughout the day. I probably read the newspaper more than I should and maybe God's word less than I should. I get in the habit. I just like to read the newspaper first thing and I think, well, boy, I should read that less and read God's word more. 
maybe we take too much time even to watch the evening news or part of it. We could cut just the first part of it, cut the last part off. Now, I don't want us to go nuts and say we can never have fun, you know what I mean. But you have to meditate all the way through. How do you love God with all of your being and still get a balance, still love your wife and spend time with your children and, and get some exercise and a change of pace? God wants us to do that too. But you want to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Boy, you talk about meditation. You're thinking about them all day long. That's what God told the carnal Israelites to do. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they'll be as frontless between your eyes. And then he tells them, when you come into the land God has promised you, and you have large and beautiful cities you not, did not build, and houses full of good things, and so on. He says in verse 12, beware lest you forget. Beware lest you forget the eternal, the ever-living one who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And we need to meditate on that. Because brought, God has brought every last one of us out of spiritual Egypt, out of this world, to know Him. And all of us, of course, sitting in the church do not fully know God. I know that. Some are not, not baptized or some are still young children. Some are sitting or not fully converted. We're aware, but they know about God at least. And that's responsibility, even if we know about God, to act on that truth. God expects us to do, to do with, with what we have to do with, and we have tremendous understanding and knowledge. Don't forget. Think about it. God has given me tremendous understanding, we can say to ourselves. He's given me the chance to know the whole purpose of human existence. I must not go back to Egypt. I must not be part of this world. I must seek first that great God and think about His law and love Him every aspect of Him, His way, His name, what He stands for, with all my heart and strength and soul and mind. So we want to meditate on those things very, very much and very profoundly and saturate our mind with God's Word. Talk about God's Word. Talk about God's law and think about it. Meditate upon it. And in our Bible study, we want to think about certain things again and again to get it in our minds. Most of you older brethren remember, but we have many newer brethren who don't remember. Mr. Armstrong would sometimes get on a new topic and he got it between his teeth like a bulldog and he would not let go of it for months, sometimes or years. He got on the two trees near the end of his life and, you know, people, oh, the two trees, the two trees. Well, some of them got sarcastic about it. They were setting the seed of the scornful. But now we need to go back and review the two trees once in a while, brethren. I think all of us. He got on the subject of man becoming God. And I had the privilege of sitting in the graduate school, we called it, where our topic was prophecy in a long, uh, oblong type uh, table in the solarium of the original library building. And so just a very few of you know where that was. But we were looking out down over the city in big picture windows and sitting around this, this table with Herman Hay and Raymond Cole and, and uh, uh, Ken Herman and Michael C. Paul Meredith, Richard David Armstrong and me and several of us. Marion and Raymond had not yet graduated. They were not there. But Mr. Armstrong was talking about prophecy. But then during one class he began to say, well, fellows, as he often would digress. Mr. Party to remember this. He came a little later, but he, how Mr. Armstrong would digress. And then he'd digress from the digression, too, at some length sometimes. But he would digress. He said, something else is coming to me, and I really got to talk about it. He said, God seems to be putting it in my mind that we are really going to be like he is, and that as God, as each creature in, in Genesis was to reproduce after his kind. Remember, you older brethren, how Mr. Armstrong always went back to Genesis. He'd always go back to the beginning and try to reason things through, the two trees and whatever it was from that first, the first revelation of something. You start at the beginning. And he said, each thing is to reproduce after its own kind. And he said, I'm beginning to think that God is reproducing after his kind, because Mr. Armstrong had said, and I heard him say back in 1949 and 50 and 51 and 52, again and again, 
He'd say, when we're born of God and born in the very kingdom of God, we'll have spirit bodies, brethren, in glory. And we will be something like a super archangel. Well, if you knew Mr. Armstrong personally, as many of us did, he normally didn't say something like. <laughs> he, he, he was right out there dogmatic. Later he came to realize we wouldn't be something like anything. We would be full sons of God, you see. But at that point he was trying to figure it out. He said, fellas, he said, if I'm getting into heresy, he says, this sounds almost blasphemous. He didn't learn that from the Mormons, my brethren. I'll tell you that before God. I know that and I know that. I'm, they have a totally different way of coming at it, totally. But he came at it from the Bible in a way that they never thought of and never will think of until God converts them someday. But he came at it from the point of view of God making each thing after his kind and a human reproduced after the human kind. And dogs reproduce after the dog kind. And cows reproduce after the cow kind and so on. And is God reproducing after the cow kind or after the goat kind or some lesser kind? No. When God calls us his sons, does he mean that? Or does he mean we're something lesser than that? But of course that didn't prove it all. He said, now that's, I'm just studying this and going he had a number of scriptures, but he had not yet back in the, gone back in the epistles of Paul. Well, that very spring, I had already convinced him to allow me to start researching to introduce the topic or the, the course, the epistles of Paul, into the curriculum of Ambassador College that autumn. And I was sitting in the back of the library night after night, and Mr. Jack Elliott's big, he had a great big desk. He was dean of students, much bigger than the little student desk Terman Hay and I had in the uh, basement over in the library. And so I borrowed his, he was very kind, and let me use his office. And I'd bring in the, it was in the library, and I could borrow all the commentaries and bring five or seven commentaries and two or three translations and begin to write notes to get ready to teach the epistles of Paul. And boy, it came flooding in my mind all these things in Paul's writings, you know, that tie in with that. We're going, we're going to have the very glory of God. And uh, he, Christ was firstborn of many brethren. And just scripture after scripture after scripture. Dr. Herman Hay also was studying things, and he began to bring in things. And, of course, Mr. Armstrong challenged us to prove him that he was wrong. He did. He was wanting to get counsel. We could not prove he was wrong, even though there were one or two who sort of wanted to, I think, <laughs> but they couldn't. The Scriptures began to come together, and God had begun to guide Mr. Armstrong to see the whole ultimate purpose of human existence. But he preached on that in Pasadena a couple of weeks. Then he let it go for a week or two. Then he came back and did it again and off a week or two. Then he did it again and he went on for months. And by the end of six months, people had been to hear every phase and facet of, of becoming God that Mr. Armstrong had ever thought about. He just went over. He meditated on it. He internalized it where he could never, ever forget it. And he turned it over in his mind again and again. And that gave him wonderful food for sermons in that way just like he did later, the, the great, the lost century, and later the two trees, and two or three other key topics he would get on from time to time. But he had a power, Herbert Armstrong did, a meditation of get, getting down and really analyzing and thinking over and over, what is this? He did that to the understanding of our national identity. He was put onto that. The Seventh-day Church of God never understood that. He came in with them, and they would not accept the holy days. They would not, were not willing to grow in that, which is a very important thing to understand the plan of God. But to understand the keys to prophecy at the end time, they couldn't understand that because they were not willing to accept the identity of Israel. And he tried to present it to them and sent this paper to A.N. Ducker who said, well, Mr. Armstrong, what you have looks very true, but it's going to can cause confusion or discontent, and the brethren will have to set it aside for this time. As some of you have seen that letter, he reproduced part of that letter in his autobiography and never brought it up again. Did Mr. Armstrong just swallow what they had? No, he did not. If you read the stuff that was put out, by the British Israel World Federation and these other groups that taught that, a lot of it was a bunch of baloney, frankly. They had pyramid inches. They talked about the Great Pyramid and you'd measure so many inches and you'd get in the inner chamber and this meant this and this meant that and prophecy and all kinds of just funny stuff, you know, kind of stupid stuff. Just went on and on with stuff like that. 
he tossed all of that out. He studied, he prayed, he analyzed, he meditated, went over and over and got it deeply in his mind to where then later he could give us the fundamental things. And even then there were a few things in the first couple of editions that were not exactly right, not some, some horrible thing, but where they'd refer to scriptures that were not uh, 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 applicable and a couple of the, one young teacher and an older student got together and all upset and came to me about it, and I got Herman Hale on my side, and we went to Mr. Armstrong, and he let us have a meeting with him and them, and he dropped those things too. He was willing to learn. He was willing to listen to multitude of counsel. He dropped over those scriptures, dropped them out of the booklet. They did not prove anything and were or misuse of scriptures at times. But he got it all straight. He kept at it, kept at it, meditating, thinking deeply, and brethren, I know he went through that process in his conversion as you read his autobiography. And I would encourage all of you to do that. If you haven't read it for years or if you've never read it before, try to get the autobiography of Herbert W. Armstrong and read it very, very carefully, especially Volume 1. Volume 1. I mentioned several times in Volume 2 but that's not important. <laughs> that's not the important one. The main part is volume one because he had to put volume two together more qui uh, quickly as he was dying and dictated it and took parts of letters and all that to get it done. But volume one is where he showed the deep, profound uh, impact of God on his life and how he dug these things out and prayed and studied and fasted and meditated to get it straight. And when you read that, you learn a lot about being deep with God. So that can be a big help in your personal meditation as well. Uh, I think, brethren, again, as these things start to happen in the world, I want you to think things through. Let's go back to Matthew 24 for a moment, if you would. Matthew chapter 24, and beginning here where we left off. He talks about false prophets, drought, famine, disease epidemics, and earthquakes. And as the Luke version of it has, Luke 21, great earthquakes, Luke says. All these are the beginning of sorrows, verse 8. And they will deliver you up to tribulation, the true people of God, and kill you. Many of our people, many people who are not praying and studying will be, have to be martyred. If they haven't been willing to give their lives to God as living sacrifices, they'll have a chance to do it otherwise. will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations. That's a promise. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Somewhere, God is going to use some of us. And if we get this work going on the Internet, perhaps 50 or 500 times more powerful than we are now, if we get on many more stations and, and television, if we can get out the message more powerfully in other ways by magazines and newspaper ads and all kinds of other ways, later personal campaigns, and if we can get as a church on our knees, and our ministry, especially on our knees, fasting, praying, meditating, that God will grant us the gifts of the Holy Spirit for we can say, be healed, and the sick will be healed, and the demons cast out, and miracles can be performed. People are going to have to notice. And we're getting down to that time. But our spiritual depth is still not down to that point yet, obviously. We would have more of that. But then, he said, many will be offended and will betray one another and hate one another. Well, we've seen that. We've seen that, haven't we? The great apostasy that took place in the late 1980s and early 90s. Many in worldwide hated some of our guts. Mr. Apartian told me a few times, he said, you are public enemy number one. He said, I pass it in, you know. And then later, another group started, and he mentioned the other man's name. I'm not trying to get people in trouble here. But he said, well, you're not public enemy number one. So-and-so is, and you're just public enemy number two. I thought, Gaspar, I've been demoted. <laughs> I've been demoted. I'm not public enemy number one now at this point. Anyway, uh, they, they do have a great uh, antipathy for those who hang on to the truth. It makes them look bad. They can't stand that. They will betray one another, then hate one another. Again, later, we may find some of those very people we used to worship with will turn us into the police, the secret police, the NKVD, whatever, the Gestapo. Yes, this type of thing will happen. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Many false prophets, not a few. 
And because lawlessness, notice the new King James is far better than the old King James in most ways. It's a lot clearer. You don't have the these and thous and all that. I'd encourage all of you to get the new King James when you can afford it. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. See, lawlessness, breaking God's law, that's what it's talking about. You know, you begin to sear your conscience by disobeying the law, and pretty soon you have a seared conscience, and when you do something bad, it doesn't hit you as hard once you started down that road. You don't have, your conscience doesn't prick you, so to speak, anymore, as it ought to do. And he who endures to the end shall be saved. Think about those things in the years to come. As these things start happening, terrible persecution, people out here going hungry, and the disease epidemics raging in Charlotte and up in Raleigh and up in Philadelphia and New York and all over the land, and people running around asking for food and doing without their food riots, gas riots, other kinds of riots. People are upset. Disease, uh, disease has filled the hospitals. They don't have enough. They don't have enough flu shots now. That's just the first shot across the bow, more or less. That's a, just a tiny beginning. What's it going to be when they have real bad stuff start? And they don't have enough medicines, and they find out later that some of their medicines don't even work. And it's too late, too bad. And they don't believe in God and God's healing. Then where are they? Man, they're going to be upset. All kinds of troubles in the land. Are we going to let that throw us? It can very easily. We have little troubles now and get all upset about little troubles. What will the big troubles do to us when they come along? Think ahead of time. Sit down quietly. Do I really believe in this invisible God who's not here? He's, you can look up and you just see this, this uh, uh, ceiling up here, these, these ceiling tiles. Can't see God. He's not here in, in a physical sense. He's unreal to most people on the earth. They don't see any difference between Saturday and Sunday or any other day, so they decided on Sunday, the ancient day of the sun, that was convenient. Why do we observe Sabbath rather than Sunday? Because we believe there is an invisible God who is very, very real. And we believe that God inspired this book. So we're willing to really, really do what this book says if it causes our, causes to lose our job, our life, whatever it is. We will obey God, period. But you have to think that through ahead of time. What will I really, really do? So brethren, think of these things before they happen. Many false prophets, you could be so easily deceived. Here this one young man came along out in Pasadena, and some of his friends told me, they said, well, you know, uh, what's his name? He's just playing games. He's cynical, this other young man. But he said, the other guy, he really believes this stuff. A couple of his friends that grew up with him in Imperial School, they said, he really believes this stuff. They were kind of amused at it, but he, he took it seriously. He had just made a great discovery. What had he discovered? mainstream Protestantism, a great discovery. But it was to him, because he grew up in the church, he got all excited about mainstream Protestantism that I had to come out of, I had to repent of, and most of you are here because you came out of that. But he got all mixed up. And what was he able to do? Because most people are so shallow, they have not thought through all these things profoundly. And he was able to get in there with the other young man and then a few other young men and influenced Mr. Decott Sr. and pretty soon the whole work went the other way, back into mainstream Protestantism. And other people were shallow. They thought, well, we just follow the work, you know, and then some did it because they sincerely thought that God will straighten it out. You know, some are still there. God will straighten it out. Well, he's not going to straighten it out. It's gone way too far, yet some still feel that way. Then others stayed there because they were just sincerely confused for a while, but were sincere, came out later. And then others, of course, stayed there because of the money. They wanted their job. They felt insecure. And they felt, well, I've got to keep my job. You know, I've got a family. One leading minister told a number of people that. I've got a family. Well, I had a family too. My wife and David and Jonathan, I had a family. An older man already in my upper 50s. It's going to be hard to go out and get a job in the world when you're 59 or 61 or 62, which I was when Global began. and never done anything else in my adult life except be a minister and Bible teacher. How do you go out and start all over again? Well, you can, but some of the guys did go out and get jobs selling insurance or whatever. My son Mike offered to help me get in the insurance industry and so on. You know, I might have made enough to go be okay or whatever. I had another son who was going to help me in a different way, but... 
you know, you've got to decide, will I trust God? Is God real? And say, okay, God is real. This is the truth. And no matter what it is, we are going to hang on to the truth. And that is it. You have to think that thing through. And not say, I have a job, or I have a family, or I need money, or whatever. No, many false prophets will deceive many. And boy, did they deceive many. And they're going to do it again later, too. Many of our people, some of you out here in TV land who hear this later, will fall away. I know that. I'm sorry. I hope you won't. But I know human nature. I've been in the church now in a sense of attending and sitting in for 55 years because they came to Ambassador College 55 years ago last month. And I've seen what happened. I start naming all the names. Many false prophets. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. They just sort of, well, they just kind of take it easy and they don't get zealous. They just give up that zeal they had. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And again, you have to ask yourself down in your heart of hearts, will I go through this? Will I seek God's kingdom above all else? Will I endure to the end? In spite of the raging mobs out there screaming, in spite of the thing people shouting against Armstrongism or Meredith or Ames or the church or whatever they call us, doesn't make any difference. We will obey the God of Abraham. We will obey the God of the Bible. That we've got to think that through ahead of time and be sure and know and know that we know what we believe and why we believe it and what we're going to do about it. Here are some keys to meditation. When do you, should you meditate? One of the best ways is while you're studying the Bible. Take time to visualize, in a sense, visualize what these verses actually mean, as I've just been doing for you in this passage. They shall deliver you up to tribulation. Picture raging mobs outside your home. You're the leader of this group, and what are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, and I'm with you guys now? You've got to picture things. Think about it ahead of time. As you study, often, as I've told you, when I studied the Bible, I read about Abraham, I read about David and his men going off here and there, and I try to jump right in the saddle and ride my horse right next to David's horse, so to speak. You know what I mean? I'm in the saddle. It becomes real. I know Dr. Herman Head, I maybe shouldn't use his name on this, but it's all right. He's a friend. He says, Rod, he says, you know, you often preach and teach and talk as though you're right down in the arena wrestling. I said, that's right. That's the way I feel. <laughs> we're, we're, he used that on me one time. He said, you're right in there wrestling, just going through the whole thing. Yeah, when I read the book of Acts, I think that's me. I've got to be in there. We've got to do this. We're going to be run out of town. We've got to talk to people. And, and no matter what, we may be, have rocks thrown at us. And I have had rocks thrown at me, by the way, and guns pointed at me more than once. But it never shot me yet. I say yet. We don't know when it will happen. But we've got to hang in there. And know it's very, very real. And visualize what these things mean and what the outcome would mean in these verses, what they would lead to. So as you study, make it real in your life. Make it real. The example of David hiding out from Saul. You might have to hide out at times later on out in the hills out here or some of us because of persecution at a certain point. Are we going to do that or are we going to give up and join the mainstream? Say, well, these wonderful Protestant ministers are all fine and they'll hang on to the truth they have. No, they won't. The vast majority of them are going to get scared to death because God is not real to them. And frankly, they're going to join the great whore. The vast majority of them will join the great whore before it's all over in this society. They will. I don't mean every one of them, but I mean the vast majority. They'll go right along with it. You'll find that. Just mark my words. A time is coming when with a few exceptions, there will be some, we will basically stand alone. And there will be times when you will stand alone and I won't be there to help you and Mr. Pardian won't be there to help you, Mr. Bryce, Mr. Ames or any other minister. We won't be there to hold your hand. You will stand alone. There have been times in my life when I have had to stand alone, totally alone, and I knew that. I knew that. I'm all alone. There's nowhere else to turn. I've got to turn to God. Is God real? Is that God of the Bible real? Does this book really mean what it says and say what it means? And so on. And you've got to do it in faith. Put your trust in that God. 
but you've got to meditate on that ahead of time. Another time to meditate profoundly is when you're praying. When you're down on your knees talking to God, don't let your mind wander. Now, I've done that too, so I don't mean mind wandering, but it's not wrong to take time as you pray to sort of talk to God. Keep your mind going. Maybe you can even, if you're in a private place where you can mumble out loud so your mind doesn't wander, you're talking out loud to God and say, well, Father, if this and that happens, I ask you to help me and help me to understand. And you're sort of thinking it through on your knees, on your knees as part of your prayer with your Father in heaven. You're meditating, you see what I mean, as part of your prayer with God. And sometimes take, you know, 20 or 30 minutes to do that. Sometimes you can learn to pray 45 minutes or an hour. You find if you learn to talk to God profoundly, 45 or 50 minutes will go by just like that, and you'll think, yes, it's late. I prayed more than I meant to. How terrible. <laughs> well, it might make you late to work once in a while, but it can, it's sure good. It, it, don't be worried about the time so much when you're talking to God. So asking God to help and talking to Him in detail about all the problems is a way to meditate as you're praying. Another time, of course, a way would be like King David, walking in the woods, taking a walk in the park, or out under the stars at night, just thinking. I remember years ago, Burke McNair and I were going out on a baptizing tour in 1952. I was a young, unmarried man, and we're going way off across the United States, all alone. We left around 9.30 or 10 at night to go through the Arizona desert when it was cool, which was better. We, we thought that was better because the cars in those days would overheat and the engine boil over and so on more than today. So we took off, and over near Tucson somewhere, we stopped. I guess we'd already got gas, I don't know, or afterward. But anyway, we stopped, and we got out and walked up this little road under the stars, and I walked up a little further than Burke and just sort of took my time and just looked up at the stars. Boy, they were down close, the Arizona sky, no smog. <laughs> and I had time, not long, but for five or ten minutes just to think. Burke and I are all alone, two young men. I was 22, he was 21. We're going out on this baptizing tour all across this nation. And we would be encountering all kinds of things as I had the previous tour. Guns pointed at us, threats against us, some threatening to kill us. And we knew that. And so I thought about it. I looked at the stars and thought of King David. I thought, well, I'm here and you're there, God. And guide us and help us and be with us as we go. And he, and he, he was. He was. And it worked out well. Talk to God. Meditate before God in all those situations. Picture Jesus Christ during the 40 days when he fasted before God. A human being, God in the flesh, but very human. And he had to cry out to God for help. Picture Jesus Christ that last night before he died. And, of course, he had great drops of sweat coming down with blood mingled with it because he was under stress, knowing he had seen men writhing in agony and crying out as they were hanging on the stake. And he was to be about hung on the stake the next day, and he knew exactly what was going to entail. Father, if there's any other way any other way. Not my will, but your will be done, though, he prayed. But he meditated, no doubt, a lot and cried out to God. Picture that. You have to think those things through before your trial comes, before my trial comes. I have to think those things through ahead of time. So we make the right decision. Another time is in the night watches. When you wake up and you can't sleep, what do you do? Just try to take another sleeping pill or something, you know? Well, that's not always a sin. I don't take regular sleeping pills, but I take melatonin once in a while, which is very not near as strong and not, not uh, habit-forming and not dangerous, apparently. But at any rate, the best thing to do is to meditate, sometimes just to sit up or go in the other room and just sit down and meditate for a while and think things through. Notice Psalm 63, if you would like to turn there, brethren. Psalm, the book of Psalms, chapter 63, and... Uh, I want to, uh, if I can find this here, Tom, Psalm 63, uh, verse 1. It's a very profound psalm when you read about it. O oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Notice how David loved God. My soul thirsts for you. And notice in my little heading I have, this is a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judea. King Saul 
was after him on occasion with 3,000 men. And David had 400 men, and later on he had 600 men, but Saul had all this big army after him. And David had seen man after man after man after man killed in war in personal battle and seen how they thrust the spear through and the blood gushed out or, you know, knocked the guy's head off or virtually with a, with a, with a you know, whatever, a mace or a, a sword and the blood and the screams and the anguish. He'd seen that over and over. He knew what, how easy it was for him to die. And here he was hiding out like a rat. But he trusted in the God of Israel. He trusted in the God of creation. He trusted in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so he said, My flesh cries out for you. My soul thirsts for you. In a dry and thirsty land when there is no water. Well, he apparently lacked water out there in the wilderness. The Judean wilderness is very dry. But also he meant it figuratively too, all alone out there. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. I'll give my life for you. Your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips when I remember you on my bed, you see, at night. He would think and meditate. I meditate on you in the night watches. You see, as he couldn't go to sleep or wake up, he'd think, and rather than letting his mind just wander, he would think about the things of God. The God of Abraham is guiding this situation. The Creator is going to deliver me from Saul. The great God of my fathers is alive. He's going to guide this. We will win this battle tomorrow, even though we're outnumbered two or three times to one by the Philistines. Or whatever it was, he thought it through in the night watches. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. That's a beautiful expression, isn't it? Under the shadow of your wings is an expression used a number of times. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. So... David cried out to God, walked with God, thought about God, meditated on the things of God, even in the night watches, and so should we. And we must learn to do those things, of course. Turn with me, if you would, at this point, brethren, to, uh, uh, well, before the pointing, I want to give you five keys as to how to meditate. Five keys as to how to meditate. Just write them down if you're taking notes. I hope you will take notes on this, as a matter of fact. First, think through all the applications of God's Word to today's society and the situations in your life. Think through all the applications of God's Word. Secondly, when things go wrong, ponder which of God's laws or ways were violated by you or others. Sometimes others did the wrong and you didn't, or often it's a combination of the two, of course. What laws were broken? And you can learn more from that, of course, if you learn to do those things. And uh, one thing I might give you here as a, as a reference, a very uh, helpful reference, is Psalm 119. Psalm 119, uh, beginning uh, here in uh, verse 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet. And a light to my path, I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. So we have to think about, will we, will we learn those lessons, you see, that God wants us to learn by his words, even though we've been afflicted. Turn back to verse 97. Oh, how love I your law, David wrote, Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how love I your law. It is my meditation all the day. All day long he meditated on and thought on, of course, the things of God. And that is a very important uh, concept uh, for, uh, for all of us. And uh, we'd uh, turn on back here another area I'd like to cover. Verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, David said. But now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me. They tried to hurt David, destroy him. But I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. 
their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. Verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I may learn your statutes. You see, sometimes when we go through trials, we learn by those trials. It is good for me that I've been afflicted. And often as I look back on the various trials, I can see why God permitted them. He didn't always do it, but he allowed it to teach me lessons I might not have learned any other way. So when things go wrong, meditate. Think about which laws and principles of God were broken by you and others and try to learn from that. Thirdly, as you read of Abraham's need to sacrifice Isaac, a terrible trial, of David's need to be loyal to Saul, even in times of stress, when Saul was trying to kill him, brethren, think through how these lessons might apply to your life, how they might apply to your life and what you would do in a similar circumstance. And then in advance, by meditation, plan to take steps to improve your future performance. Picture the upsets in the church. Picture the outside persecutions, as I've said before, and what would you do? What will you do? The fourth key, when a big decision looms, something really big you have to decide in your life, maybe it's the sale of your home, which is a fairly big decision, or a decision to move, maybe you'd move to a different city, or change a job, or if you had to even leave a mate, and hopefully none of you will ever have to do that, but that might be have to happen because of persecution or some terrible thing, and that's a huge decision, or whatever. When a big decision looms, or long-range planning is necessary, think through, think through, meditate on it ahead of time, the spiritual pros and cons in light of the Bible. Think it through very carefully. For instance, if you're moving somewhere, I know I've had brethren out in Pasadena years ago say, well, we're going to move up to such and such Montana. And this was before Mr. McNair was up there, and they were moving somewhere, not Helena, but where there was no church. And some of them were going to move up, one, one family member up near the Idaho wilderness area. I said, well, yeah, we'll be closer to God up there. Oh, you will? You'll be closer to mountains and trees and wolves and bears, and that part's good. But there's no church of God there. How will you be fed? How will you be able to learn the lessons of working together as a team in the body of Christ if you put yourself way up there all alone, all cut off from God's people? And I would ask all of you here, and certainly your brethren around the world, some of you will get upset. Maybe you're a minister way out in the Philippines or Australia or wherever you are, or here in the United States or Canada, will do something wrong. Shocking. A minister would do something wrong, <laughs> make a mistake. No, I think I'll leave. Okay, you want to leave and go join another fellowship or leave the church of God altogether. That would be one of the most profound decisions you could possibly make, and you'd better think it through. You'd better think, is God real? Does this book say what it means and mean what it says? And if you leave the living church of God, for instance, where on earth is there another church that really says it the way it is, teaches the whole way of God to that extent, and secondly is really out at the forefront, the spear point of God's work where you would get a greater reward forever and ever and ever by being part of that direct work of Christ, and also is not only learning but practicing the, go the government of God, the very government we're going to be teaching and administering in a few years. Where else is another church like that? If I were to die tomorrow, I don't know of any other, and I don't think you do either if you're honest about it, but you have to meditate on that. Think it through ahead of time, ahead of time. When big decisions come, again, uh, let's go to the book of Proverbs, if you would, for a moment on this particular point, a scripture or principle I often bring up, but in that connection, Proverbs 15, without counsel plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. At least three times in the book of Proverbs, God tells us to get a multitude of counselors. Don't just get one or two opinions, and especially those that already agree with you anyway. But try to get people that are really sound and dedicated to see what they would tell you, and so on. Get a multitude of counsel, plus study the Bible, and most of all, and get God's counsel through deep, profound Bible study, meditation, and prayer. 
So this is so important to make the right decisions, to get counsel. Fifthly, the fifth key, every week, every week take spiritual inventory of your spiritual growth now, your own personal spiritual growth. You don't have to do it in front of someone else. Just do it yourself. How far have I come since last Passover? How much closer to God am I, really? And try not to kid yourself. Take spiritual inventory and try to understand the weaknesses that you have, the sins that you're still committing, and get a plan to do better. Get a plan to do better. One of the best times to do that, of course, would be Sabbath, Sabbath morning. You could set aside maybe time for Bible study and prayer, and then after maybe getting your heart close to God, then just sit there for 30 or 45 minutes, take a walk in between, don't let your blood get stale, <laughs> be awake, but at some point, if you can't do it Sabbath, do it Sunday if you're off work. On a weekend, is probably the best time just to sit there and think things through, or sometimes at night if you're alert and can do it then without being hurried. And to think it through very carefully. Why am I here? What am I really doing? How close to God am I? And so on. And don't kid yourself. Take spiritual inventory. Uh, let's go over those five keys. Key number one, think through all the applications of God's Word to today's society and to your life. Key number two is you meditate. Think through when things go wrong, why did they go wrong? What laws and principles of God were broken by whom and why? Key number three, as you read of Abraham's need to sacrifice Isaac and David's need to be loyal to Saul and you think of those things, apply those lessons all the way through to your, your life. How would you handle those situations and try to think through what you would do ahead of time? Key number four, when a big decision looms in your life, to get married or to get unmarried, as I said, or to make some big change of some sort, then you need to really sit down and meditate profoundly with study and prayer and get multitude of counsel. Fifth, weekly take spiritual inventory of your life. How far have I come? You want to ask yourself in all honesty and turn now, if you would, to 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians at this point, chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Paul writes, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. God tells us to do this, not just at Passover time. It's not a Passover scripture. It's any time. Do it all through your life. Examine yourselves whether you're really in the faith. How close are you to Christ? How much do you reflect Jesus Christ? Is God truly first in this and that and some other part of your life? Or do you have some corner of your life that you're hiding out from God? Prove yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you're disqualified? Either Christ is in you or you're disqualified. You won't be there. You won't be in God's kingdom at all unless Christ is in you. He may not be perfectly in you every step of the way, but he'd better be guiding your life over you overall or you won't be there. So examine yourselves. Another word for meditate. Meditate on these things. In closing, turn again to Psalm chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law, or the word we could say, of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He's going to be meditating on these things. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in the season whose leaf shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. In the end, God will deliver him. In the end, God will fight his battles. In the end, as Mr. Armstrong said, we win.